Welcome to the Future of Solar Photoelectrics podcast. I'm joined by my co-founder of this podcast, who was our first ever guest. We've completed now 12 episodes plus one theme track. This is our 14th installment. Our industry-led podcast is now listened to in 83 countries. 45% of the listeners are in the UK, ranking consistently high on uh, Google. Um, I'll start first by introducing myself again. My name is Vikram. Um, I've worked on over two and a half gigawatt of UK solar projects. I cooperate with a Swiss company uh, called Studa, who've delivered to over 100 gigawatts of projects worldwide. Uh, Matthew, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Yeah, thanks very much, Vikram, for having me on the podcast again. It's, uh, yeah, been a year and a lot has happened in a year. It's been great. Um, my name is Matthew Zanakis. I'm the UK sales manager, UK and Ireland sales manager for utility scale solar, uh, working at JA Solar. Fantastic. And um, Matthew, do you want to tell us a bit about JA Solar, um, uh, their footprint, their capacity, turnover, organization? Yeah, so J Solar is a um, massive um, solar panel manufacturer, um, global capacity of 100 gigawatts, um, about a 15% uh, global market share, install panels globally in uh, over 165 countries. They're listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, um, and they've got over 81 billion RMB in revenue from 2023. Well, life is short, and uh, uh, we have a tragedy to cover. One of the key figures in the industry, Mr. Stuart Bradshaw, unfortunately and shockingly passed away this summer. It reminds us, you know, that you know, don't take anything for granted, and you know, it has shocked us through the industry. And we try with this uh, volunteer run podcast to to uphold standards, but also to remember our colleagues and partners that that you know were with us in the past, and unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, that aside, it's been a very exciting year, uh, very much developer-driven. Uh, we will talk about the UK pipeline in a bit more detail shortly. But Matthew, how was last year for you at J Solo and, and personally? Yeah, it's been a very busy year, um, I'm sure, for everyone in the industry. Um, every time you have a call with someone, they... It's now customary to say how busy you are, um, but it's, it's a good thing in the industry. Um, and yeah, it just shows the the progress that's been made in the in the solar industry at the moment. You know, there's more conferences, um, the the industry's growing. There's um, sort of people moving from different industries into solar, uh, which sort of shows how how the industry is growing, which is which is great to see. And what were the, some of the things uh, you said in the last uh, podcast? You had a forecast about the industry. Would you say your expectations have been met? So I think I said that we are likely to hit about two gigawatts of solar in the UK um, this year. Um, I think we may fall short of that. Um, I think pr um, in 2022, we did about 1.3 gigawatts. Um, in 2023, probably about 1.7. Um, so it's likely that we'll we'll fall just short of two gigawatts again, um, but I think you know in the years to come, two gigawatts is going to start becoming three gigawatts and three gigawatts, four gigawatts. So I think it's going to grow quite fast. Fantastic, and compliance is a huge topic right now. And uh, you mentioned you had compliance training earlier today. Do you want to tell us a bit about how J Solar making sure they're compliant to UK and European regulations? Yeah. So. Um, Obviously, it's become a major topic, um, and rightly so. Um, we're obviously trying to ensure that we've got a transparent supply chain, um, you know, showing the origin of all our raw materials, particularly um, in the polysilicon sort of side of the supply chain. Um, you would notice now J Solar's now um, marketing an ITS strategy, which stands for Integrated Traceability System. If you flip a panel over, you'll see that it's got an ITS number with sort of four four numbers on the back. Each number corresponds to the factory, mm -hmm. and it shows that it's come from a sort of customized supply chain, which um, sort of gives the customer a bit of confidence that 
the the panels are ethically sourced and that you know Jay just doesn't stand for any sort of modern slavery or or anything of the sort. Fantastic. And now, um, when we first recorded our first episode with you, we were talking about a terawatt of PV global cumulative capacity being hit. Uh, I think within a year, we've now going past two terawatts. This is hard to imagine the figures. Uh, what is your view from uh, generally your headquarters about the growing global deployment of PV and, and what kind of impacts does it have on, on JS Solar? Yeah, I mean, uh, JS Solar is really well poised in the market, uh, being one of the larger manufacturers. Um, they tend to be really conservative, you know, um, especially in the sort of day and age with uh, squeezed margins for, for, for PV manufacturers. So Jay has been very conservative and um, they're well poised to sort of um, keep expanding in this forever growing market. Um, I mentioned that we've got 100 gigawatts uh, capacity um, mm. and that's completely all in type Topcon um, and we, we think, you know, like the market's just going to carry on improving. Um, so, for example, the, the panels two years ago were 550 watts. Now we're looking at about 630, 640 watt panels. So the technology is getting better, um, production's increasing, quality's improving, um, market's becoming more standardized as well, which obviously helps developers and EPCs with, with installs. So um, it's all looking very positive in, 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 in the outlook. Fantastic. I've got here some very specific notes about the UK market. Uh, I'm focusing heavily on the official government data, which may lag behind what's really going on in the market. There's been an enormous developer-focused activity. Uh, we've been faced with numerous challenges with um, rising material costs, uh, or labor costs. The solar panels seem to be going in the opposite direction. But if we extrapolate the data from the Department for Net Zero and Energy Security, which some of you may know previously as Depart the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and in the early days as the Department for Energy and Climate Change, it's the same government department, just the names changing. It's the Department for Net Zero now. Uh, the UK is a very transparent country. Anyone can go have a look and download the figures, which drives transparency through the market and the sector. Uh, one of the reasons why what, uh, it makes London a financial powerhouse is, is the transparency, which allows investors to have some kind of confidence, despite the turbulences we've uh, endured with Brexit, with COVID, with the Ukraine energy crisis and, and the labor shortages that have come. Some of these are uh, replicated throughout other European countries as well. So if you look at the overall picture, there's approximately nine and a half gigawatt of solar farms <coughs> installed in the UK. If we talk only about operational assets, about one megawatt, not looking at domestic, not looking at private wire, which might not be visible behind the meter. The market started you know, almost from nothing. I've been in this uh, sector for about 20 years, 12 and a half years full time. 2011, we started only with uh, 50 megawatts, 2012, 75 megawatts. Then that jumped to the peak uh, in the UK at two and a half gigawatts in 2015. Of course, in 2016, we had the B word Brexit and the pipeline dropped to, you know, one and a half gigawatts in 2017 and almost just falling off a cliff edge in large scale at uh, 36 megawatts in 2019 and, uh, you know, 53 megawatts in 2021. It was a low point, but it started to recover after COVID, you know, starting to, uh, to go to 22 and 23 megawatts operation, operational solar farms in 2022. 240 megawatts in 2023 and at the moment you know we had forecasted there was 1.6 gigawatts in construction of live solar farms at large scale we're forecasting only about 400 megawatts of that might go online this year uh, this is the official government data Matthew you might have a different view on that because you talk a lot earlier to some of the developers and, and the investors what is your view do you think the figure of 370 megawatts by the end of this year, it sounds a bit too low. I think it could be accurate. Um, although it's, as you, you mentioned, that the, the information sometimes lags. Um, mm -hmm. Things may be built but not finished yet. Well, in the, in the process of being built but not finished yet. Um, so sometimes the, 
modules shipped doesn't equal finished build. Um, so th there's definitely lag time there, um, but there are also very clear instances of project delays. So um, projects haven't been turned on yet for whatever reason, um, but we do see that quite a bit in the industry at the moment where projects that were gonna get built in 2022 are, are not even built yet. They're mm -hmm. still in the process of being built. So um, for numerous different reasons, each each is, each is one's sort of unique, but yeah, so I'm sure that data is pretty accurate, but the, 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 the actual finished built solar projects, that sounds about right. Absolutely, and to, to separate, you know, real projects from a lot of pipeline talk uh, we saw this time last year approximately 1.6 gigawatt solar farms were in construction and it looks likely that about 25 percent of that will go in operation this year uh, some of the data that is lagging uh, may not be covered in the government figures just yet the report is quarterly so the last report will be out at the end of December. But if you apply the same logic that 25% of solar farms may go into operation this year from the 1.6 gig in construction, now that de the Department for Net Zero and Energy Security shows 2.5 gigawatt solar in construction, about 25% of that will be approximately 600 megawatts. So if you set a conservative forecast of large-scale solar by 1 megawatt, not considering uh, small rooftops and domestic, then we can conservatively forecast 600 megawatts to go operational next year. Um, that would be the highest number since 2018, which was 627 megawatts. And now, if you put that into perspective, you know, only one solar farm, the largest one or the second largest in construction now is Cleve Hill Solar Farm, 373 megawatts peak DC potentially. You know, I'm uh, open to be corrected if I'm wrong. So more than 50% of next year's pipeline may be Cleve Hill Solar Farm. Uh, there's Longfield, which is 400 megawatt solar, 100 megawatt battery potentially could be another one. But there are, you know, huge, huge uh, uh, labor challenges. And, uh, you know, the government target is to hit 70 gigawatts of solar within the next 10 years or so, which means we need to be doing five gigawatts per year. And we're not getting anywhere close to that. We're approximately 90% behind budget. So something needs to change. You know, if you, I will leave a link uh, in this podcast to the pipeline data, which is all NDA compliant and public data. At the moment, in <clears throat> not considering the 200 gigawatts of grid applications, you know, there's going to be pressure now to, you know, separate the real projects from the ones that never intend to be built or can't be financed. There's a huge number of... I would say almost spammy grid applications, which are highly speculative. If you separate those from the real projects that have some meat on the bone, you know, some real investment behind, then we could say approximately 26 gigawatt of solar is in advanced planning stages, uh, of which six gigawatt is above 50 megawatt size projects. If you reel off some names, you've got a 600 megawatt project in planning now called Cotton Solar Project, Gate Burt is 531 megawatts, Sonic Energy Farm, East and West is 500 megawatts, Tilbridge is 500 megawatts, Longfield is 500 megawatts, including the battery, so perhaps that's the grid connection. Heckington Fen is another 500 megawatts. But all in all, majority of this 26 gigawatts is made up of projects that are on average 35 megawatts in size. What are your thoughts about the 26 gigawatts in pipeline? And clearly, not a lot of this is entering construction. So how do you call a spade a spade and identify the real prospects in the market? So I think the large, larger projects come with more risk, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and in obviously in some communities, you, you don't want fields and fields of solar panels surrounding you. So there's more um, sort of hoops to jump through in order to get those consented mm -hmm. and um, you know have the communities all agree um, for those things to, to happen. Um, the sweet spot does seem to be around the, the 35 megawatt mark. Um, it seems to be easier for planning, mm -hmm. um, not as much risk. And in terms of, of price, you, you obviously don't need as much upfront capital or, or you know take on that much debt to, 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 to get these solar farms built. Um, so I think that you, you will consistently see these 35 megawatt um, farms be built out in the next 10 years just consistently you know um 
kind of thing and then you will get the odd cleave hill sort of project where these these will get installed and uh yeah obviously it's 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 all a, a thing to to make sure that the uk has um energy security given the, the sort of geopolitical landscape landscape mm. at the moment one of our early episodes was by a very popular figure in the industry he's a very nice guy mr clive cosby he was involved in the construction of the previous larger solar farm called shopwick solar farm uh, some other large ones called Owl's Hatch, and he was uh, good enough to be one of our early guests because, you know, clearly we've got 26 gigawatts in planning. Not a lot of it is actually getting shovel ready or even in construction, and those in construction are not achieving the COD or contract on delivery when they may be generating the first energy when it becomes a real project. And people can listen to uh, Clive's podcast. And my motivation for convincing Clive to come on, and he took a considerable risk on himself, working for EDF, the largest energy trader in the country. Uh, you know, this is a charity-led podcast, so, you know, it's for everyone in the industry that's involved. I asked Clive, how did you construct the largest solar farm in the past? You know, 72 megawatts short week, land weren't, maybe 75 megawatts commissioned potentially in 2022. There's hardly been any action happening, you know, to hit our targets. You know, solar may not be the magic bullet, but it's a big part of it. And we need to do volume and we need to do it compliantly, not upsetting landowners, engaging with the community is a huge uh, undertaking. And I asked Clive very bluntly, I said, Clive, how were your te- was your team so successful before and why are we struggling now? And we have to reflect on the culture because obviously Brexit created a lot of uncertainty. It upset a lot of our European partners. And now there's more uncertainty in Europe, so there's interest again in the UK market. But then there was COVID, which was a worldwide pandemic. You know, people doing hybrid working. In Delhi now, they're asking half the population to work from home because of pollution. So the world has changed. We're not going back to where we were pre-2020. But one of the realities are, if you've got a 50 megawatt solar farm, it's like having 50 million pounds in a suitcase left in a field. And, you know, if you haven't got site managers, you haven't got dedicated teams, people are working in silos, you're not going to get a a delivery team effective enough to actually deliver something that has value. What are your thoughts on on some of the challenges that we're facing and what what do we need to do to drive a culture towards delivery? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, One one major shortage, I think, at the moment is labour. You know, getting good workers in, um, which Brexit obviously hindered quite he- uh, heavily. Um, there's there's some really good UK EPCs out there, and also some some good European EPCs that that are entering the UK market, which will I think will help um, accelerate the builds of these. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got some companies that are developing and building, which are both UK based, um, and they're doing really well at the at the time being, um, just because you know they develop when they're ready, and then they build when they're ready. Um, and they're able to get things moving at their own pace where um, developers looking for EPCs sometimes have to work at the EPC's pace. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, one of the, the, the major issues is skill and labor, um, trying to get the right people in the right places to make sure that the, the solar farm gets built properly and up to the right standard um, and in time. Fantastic. Jay, I have a strong name in the industry. I've been working as a self-employed uh, small business, uh, obviously part of larger manufacturer uh, manufacturers as an agent, uh, but the reality is profit and loss. You have to hit your sales budget. You have to hit your profit and loss, and unfortunately, there there seems to be a p- uptick in uh, redundancies amongst the financial sector now because you know a lot of these projects that are development heavy, ultimately they need to go into construction to realize their cash flows, and you know the market is extremely volatile. Because um, you know, people talk about how much does it cost to develop a solar farm. It's depending on who you talk to, some people say it costs 10 to 20 megawatt to develop a greenfield site. By the time it's shovel ready, it's 100,000 pounds a megawatt. Some people had said it costs 200,000 pounds a megawatt to get a solar farm shovel ready to a stage where it's RTB, another acronym that people use, ready to build. Whatever way you put it, you know, developing solar farm is more than modules. You know, selling at a high end at twenty pence a watt, EPC prices are fluctuating on smaller scale. It's a lot more, probably double below uh, five megawatt sites. But you know, large sites, some of the big EPCs and investors, they're not interested in anything below twenty megawatts. They want scale. 
to justify the economies of scale. So say, for example, you develop very expensively for 20 pence a watt, you EPC very cheaply for 50 pence a watt, you've got 70 pence a watt to, uh, to have a site that's fully developed and in operation. Of course, there's feed-in tariffs, there's fluctuating energy prices. We are in the middle of an energy war, which seems to be getting worse and worse. Uh, hopefully, things will stabilize. But there is this big transaction where you know the Tukum portfolio was sold for almost one pound forty a watt. So potentially, you know, in the best case, there could be fifty percent margin for doing things properly. However, the trend I'm noticing is that the EPCs come under enormous pressure. They don't benefit from owning the asset. They've got you know small margins, you know, eight to twenty percent. You make one mistake, you know, there's cost overruns, you can easily go under. What is your view on how these projects can be financed, given that there is a massive exit strategy, but a huge amount of risk between going shovel ready and, and going into operation? Well, I think there's a lot of money that's going into solar at the moment. Um, you've got pension funds, you've got, you know, private equity companies, you've got a whole lot of different companies that are providing finance um, for these solar farms. And I, don't, I honestly don't think money's the problem because mm -hmm. solar are showing the right returns for people that are holding the projects. I think you mentioned there, the Tukin por portfolio got bought for £1.40. Um, and yeah, there's obviously still um, money to be made in solar, hen hence why the industry is growing so fast. Like we can call a spade a spade again and say mm. that you know the the industry wouldn't be growing unless there were people were making money and it's it's really good obviously that it's helping mm -hmm. the environment which is why i hope most of us get into it but mm -hmm. it it helps the industry growing to grow where 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 the money is so i think um a big part of it's also energy security um knowing that with the the ukraine crisis that you mentioned that you know once we've got energy security um, and we've built all our solar farms and everything. Um, solar will just keep ticking on and, and as, as the sort of UK grows. Absolutely. The numbers are approximate. Anyone can go have a look on the Schroeder's Green Co acquisition of Toucan. About approximately 513 megawatts was purchased for 700 million pounds. Some of my investor friends in the industry would tell us, you know, they may be under more lucrative feed and tariff regimes. Now we, have, we may have CFD which uh, may be uh, lower in values, but whatever the case, we need to accelerate towards uh, solar deployment, also for other renewable energies, but the focus of this podcast is the future of solar photovoltaics. This is what we are here to discuss, and uh, with an enormous pipeline, you know, it, the reality is, you know, we've hit two terawatts worldwide, this almost entirely being driven by China, what is your view on that with respect to the volume that's going active in China in terms of new solar farms? Well, China's the industrial hub of the world at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. They have the most energy demand, mm -hmm. hence why they're installing the most uh, solar panels. They also produce 90% of the world's solar panels, so it makes sense for them to use it. Um, they obviously also... Um, building out coal fire plants and everything at the moment too um, but it's good to see that it's going in the right way they're looking to peak their carbon emissions by 2030 mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. meaning it's still looking to increase the carbon emissions but by then it's looking to to be completely um, kind of net zero by 2050 uh, so with the rate that they're going, um, anything sort of possible. If you think about it, uh, we were talking about two to three gigawatts in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, they're installing 200 gigawatts. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's lucrative. Fantastic. And, you know, China's just leaving everyone in the shadows with the volumes they are establishing, especially in the renewable energy space. There is now um, a lot of... Um, discussions with the unions in, in Germany about Volkswagen potentially reducing in capacity because uh, in China, not only in solar, but also in battery storage, the prices of batteries are collapsing as well. And you know, lithium prices may have come down by 90%. You know, no one would have imagined these kind of situations only a year ago. 
And so there is a force, you know, which is China has taken its um, net zero commitment seriously. You know, they are building coal power plants, but equally installing more energy than anyone else in terms of solar, in terms of battery storage, in terms of EV. They've got now probably the largest EV electric vehicle manufacturer. And this has a knock on effect with our relationship with China and our colleagues in the industry. There's now a logistical reality where there's an oversupply of uh, solar panels. Um, there's an extreme price pressure on modules. There's, of course, a lot of anger because if you are a wholesaler or you know, a contractor and you've bought in modules and the prices are dropping so enormously, what do you do? So there is a logistical reality and a lot of tension also mentioned on the PV Magazine blogs about the prices of solar panels as it stands what is your as one of the market leaders in the uk and europe you mentioned 100 gigawatts worldwide that's huge what is your view on the current pricing situation in modules and how should your colleagues and clients in the industry perceive that so as you mentioned it's uh, supply versus demand um, the whole problem stems from an oversupply of polysilicon in china um, if we look back into let's say beginning of 2022 price of polysilicon was 310 RMB per kg. Now it's sitting at 45, um, which is a massive decrease. Um, and this is because there's excess polysilicon in the market. Excess polysilicon enables, you know, more manufacturing from other, other well, more players to enter the game of manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, which then sort of floods the market. There's mm -hmm. now oversupply of solar panels compared to the demand. We also mentioned that people aren't building as fast as they mm -hmm. um, were um, sort of expected to. So this has caused a, a sort of global trend where, where panels are in excess. So rather than holding panels, people are, are willing to sell them at, you know, uh, sort of as, as at cost price. That it, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what this is doing is um, forcing the price downward. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In these sort of situations, it's 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 yeah really important to just make sure that you've got good relationships with manufacturers um that can sort of help weather the storm um i'm sure as a as a cable man um a manufacturer you you, you understand that too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely um i think the whole uh, market is very exciting um what i've noticed is people that were market leaders in the past uh, working for very big companies such as Soul Century, um, Wersel, uh, you know, and, and other similar companies. Um, now the, the market's changed entirely. So there's been mergers and acquisition activity, and there's been entrance of huge companies uh, from the energy sector with EDF, from the oil and gas sector uh, with Total and BP and so on. And uh, you know, there's also smaller investors that were development heavy but may not have the credit rating to build by themselves so naturally they look for a large epc a large big conglomerate conglomerate you know with 100 billion turnover in that region to come in and take on the construction finance risk and you may get companies that don't have much solar experience but look at the huge sales numbers they can achieve from building a solar plant, if you build a you know three hundred megawatt solar farm at fifty pence a watt, what, what is that? One hundred fifty million turnover. You know, so it's in one order. Some companies can do more than the entire business unit, but good projects do come at a cost, and this creates a lot of legal tensions. When people go into build, they realise they've got local tensions, community engagement still to do, a huge logistical challenge. A three hundred megawatt project can need a small container ship. A thousand shipping containers of modules it might collapse the roads and you know then you got uh, a human resource issue you have very small teams you have to suddenly grow 300 people teams and suddenly you realize your margin is not enough to cover the risk and so the people who are more experienced they may not want to take on the risk themselves um, so they look for a large company to take on the risk but we can see from the data there are no winners if the project doesn't achieve commercial operation and no one wins from litigation so um in terms of the uh, the future ideal project how do you see that taking shape i think as times 
progressed we've gotten more experience in delivering mm -hmm. solar farms mm -hmm. we look at the freedom tariff how big the projects were then yep. compared to what's getting built out now um so confidence is obviously growing in the mm -hmm. in the larger projects mm -hmm. and the the norm back in the day was consistent sort of five megawatt farms we're now talking mm -hmm. consistent 35 megawatt farms mm -hmm. so i think it's just going to get it's all about experience and that you know um, upskilling people it all comes back to labor and skills I think um, so the more experience we get the more um, these sort of things will be achieved if you look at the successes in the past unlike many other industries in solar you have to be um, lean you have to procure directly you know contract with the labor directly one of the issues with relying on the bank of a party to get your project finance from the bank is that they need to then subcontract the same laborers, the same engineers, the same materials, and just the exchange rate can be more than people's margin or the fluctuation in the metal prices or the module prices. You know, some of the top engineers are getting a thousand pound a day. You know, you you can't replace them with with laborers. So, you know, we have to think about that. That in the past. So Century was successful is because they were managing everything almost directly. When you go through a big company, they might have a great sales team, but then their CFOs will not be happy when they're looking at red figures and then the bank wants to come after them because you know people have got financial models that they need to deliver us given number of megawatt hours to hit the financial models to return shareholder investment. And if you're not able to deliver in the end, if you've got a capex of you know 250 million plus for a 500 megawatt single site, that's enough to take some companies under. So one of the things I respect about JS Solar, and I've noticed this over the last 10 years or so, that they have a tremendous name in the market. It seems to have a disproportionate market share. To me, it looks like you're talking to more than half the market, if not supplying to them. So it's no wonder that you you guys are still around. You seem to have a very stable team with uh, Alistair and Alexa and obviously yourself, Matthew. But for me, from my own learning perspective and also for our colleagues in the industry, how do Jay differentiate themselves in the market given the price situation and how do you keep such a loyal client base? Yeah, so I think one big aspect of it is obviously we, we stay cost competitive. Mm -hmm. um, it helps being vertically integrated. We we manufacture everything mm -hmm. from the ingot all the way through to the module, which which helps you know control costs. Mm -hmm. um, Alistair's been very good at pushing the traceability side of things. Mm -hmm. um, he came up with the ITS scheme with Alexa, mm -hmm. um, and that's really helped show the market you know that we're not hiding. We're willing to to sort of um, you know uh, put ourselves out there, show that we're transparent, show that we're compliant. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that. And then there's the, the obvious aspect of, um, just interaction with clients and, and making sure that the, the sales is done, the sale is done right. Um, after sales support, pre-sales support. Mm -hmm. Um, and one thing that Jay has done very well is, is they, they tend to be really conservative in the market. So, um, we, 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 we try to come across, um, knowing that we can deliver mm -hmm. um, and don't overpromise. promise um, that way mm -hmm. no one's no one's losing out at the end absolutely trust is a huge currency because one of the funny terms people use in the pub is brag awards you know there's a lot of people that you know do talk about huge numbers it's very easy to go to google earth and draw a red line and say i've got a terawatt pipeline <laughs> But to understand the magnitude of what people are saying and to separate the serious players from those that are just learning about the market, I wouldn't say anything negative about them. I think they're learning about the market. It takes over 20 years to make another sort of century and to bring up a team like that from scratch is not so easy. You need to develop people. A lot of senior uh, 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 people in the industry are retiring you know, and now if you face the reality of hybrid working or some people completely working from home or different countries, they're not in team environments where they get to bounce off their colleagues. And with solar, it's a changing game. Uh, this leads us nicely to, you know, DC fire safety, uh, you know, because if you look at Southwark Solar Farm from over 10 years ago, we were building with 250 watt J modules 
and 26 kilowatt string inverters. Now, some of these big national significantly infrastructure projects, or NSIPs as they're known, or even the smaller ones, which is like nine megawatts. Mega means millions, so nothing with mega is small. But nine megawatts is considered a tiny project with respect to the you know six gigawatt system construction that's over 50 megawatts, right? So now we have projects with JM and also other modules like Trina and others, Canadian, etc. You can have bifacial solar panels, which are you know 630 watt peak, double sided modules. The albedo is a reflected generation. You can have 400 kilowatt string inverters, and you are working in sales now. But I remember from our previous podcasts is that you did study engineering, electrical background, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And one of the known issues in the market is, you know, if you're going only on price, is that it is a power plant. You are dealing with a couple of solar panels can be enough to start welding with. And there is an enormous DC fire safety issue because solar panels are current limiting devices. I did cheat a bit. I did read up on this last night. Solar panels are current limiting devices. They're not like AC uh, sources that will fluctuate in frequency that can you know, interrupt the circuit if something goes wrong. They're not batteries which can drain the entire capacity, so you blow a fuse. With solar panels, if the fuse rating is 20 amps and it, the maximum a string of solar panels in series can generate, for example, 15 amps, and you have an installation failure on the modules or on the string cables or on the MC4s or anywhere in the system, if the electricity starts to leak to ground, there's no way you can interrupt the circuit. What are your thoughts about the actual engineering side of things? No, you're, you're 100% correct. And that's something that's been highlighted in the industry more and more at the moment. Um, we're seeing fires on rooftops. We're seeing fires on uh, um, solar farms. Um, I think, mm -hmm. as, you, as you know, um, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, as we've talked about, is that you got to do things properly. Yep. You got to make sure you use the right components. You got to mm -hmm. make sure that it's everything's checked. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. part of the checks and part of the safety pr uh, parts of it are mm -hmm. um, on site. Mm -hmm. you, you, mm -hmm. you really don't want any casualties on a solar farm when things are being installed, let alone five years later. Mm -hmm. um, five years later, when no one's on site, is probably better than when the thing has been built. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of things about training and making sure that things are done correctly with the, the right certifications. Like we have to go through very rigid um, mm. fire certifications for our modules. So if you're using a module without fire certificates, then um, you, you're asking for trouble. Absolutely, and people from outside the industry, they may not be aware that it, it is a boom and bust cycle because uh, you know I'm, I'm a big believer in a just transition. You know, oil and gas or energy is the largest sector in the world. and if you're changing everyone to electric vehicles, to solar panels, to wind turbines, we have to take people forward with us because you know a badly designed solar farm may n uh, not necessarily be better than an oil and gas asset. And now you know we are facing an energy crisis. You know there were people queuing up for fuel, and so you have to take people forward with you. And a lot of things were done very very fast because of the changing nature of feeding tariffs and other things and and now we're in a situation you know that you know that the market is screaming out for a delivery team that is able to you know deliver good projects and um, so you know i very much respect the work that you do and uh, now if you talk about few few more fun things less serious topics actually before we go on to that uh, there's another thing i do want to say when we were walking in the gold rush before Brexit, and we, I won't mention any specific names to keep everyone out of any controversy, but we were walking around mounting structures, and some of the innocent questions people would ask, I'll be one of them, why do we need earthing on solar mounting structures? You've got so many piles deep into the ground, it's natural earthing, why do we need any earthing? And, and the thing that's sobering is, if you've got 1,500 volt strings, you know, a 373 megawatt solar farm can have 23,000 plus strings at 1,500 volts. You, know, you can have 26 strings landing into one string inverter. You know, 500 amps could be the potential at 1,500 volts. That can't be interrupted. All the inverter can do is switch off if there's insulation failure, but the string carries on generating to ground. 
And so, for example, if you've got installation failure on a connector or modules or string cable, for example, and you're bleeding 1500 volts to uh, one mounting rail, and another mounting rail is at zero potential, and a poor worker that's cleaning that module or installing a new load of solar panels, they can be subject to do an enormous electric shock. So people should not underestimate the health or safety undertaking. For sure. Uh, because if there is an incident, you know, it's not going to be good for anyone. And so that's, that is the heavy part of things that we will cover offline with our engineers and our clients. But the fun part is you are a co-founder of this podcast. Um, probably 10 years younger than me. You gave me the idea to start this podcast. And I think it's been an enormous success. It's been listened to in 83 countries. Our podcast has now been transcribed on Apple Podcasts for accessibility. So if someone wants to read uh, the transcripts whilst listening, they can do so. Our podcast is also available on other popular platforms like Spotify and Amazon Audible. We've been treated almost like an uh, e-book. Uh, so it's actually enormous and you know now listen to in 83 countries 45 percent of listeners are in the uk this podcast is not designed to be a clickbait or some kind of marketing gimmick but rather to deliver collaboration uh, within the industry to let people have a voice uh, what has been your feedback on the podcast since you did the first episode yeah i think um you saw yourself short, Vikram. I think um, it's it's been fantastic, and uh, you've really pushed this this podcast forward very well. Um, and yeah, I think the, the industry loves it. Um, it's good to hear people's opinions, and mm -hmm. and also just to you know brush up on some of the information that other people have. Like for example, you know, listening to John Davies about the quality side of pa um, modules and mm -hmm. a and that sort of thing was was really good to hear. Um, despite even me being in the uh, the, the PV side of things, uh, mm -hmm. I definitely learned a lot from John. Um, and yeah, for, for, from a lot of the other guests as well. So yeah, I, I encourage anyone that wants to come and uh, and give some information on the podcast to come to to put their hand up. Fantastic. And you've designed the logo as well, so you should give yourself some credit. Oh, well, that was sponsored by ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> well, artificial intelligence is another massive topic to, to get into. And I've been told by a former client of mine, now a good friend, Mr. David Binnis, who was uh, basically, to me, a chief engineer at Soul Century, uh, you know, that he can have very long drives to site visits and he finds it refreshing listening to you and other guests and reflecting on the past. And, you know, it's all in positive spirit and because a lot of us are working remotely now it's a way for us to communicate with each other to get us back working together on site in offices remotely as well and so uh, before i thank you for participating in another podcast you know video for the first time um what are your views and or what what message would you give out to the people listening to this and and uh, and future participants well, uh, future participants, um, looking forward to hearing what you, what you have to say. Um, hopefully, we can we can churn out a few more podcasts this year and make it a monthly thing. Um, and yeah, I think the information is king. You know, the more we can share amongst the industry, the the less problems we're going to have. You know, we've talked about fire safety that might prevent some some accidents happening in the future. So. Yeah, I think information sharing is, is really important in the industry, especially um, with the way we're about to see the solar industry grow. So, yeah. Fantastic. And, you know, I've been asked to write articles for Forbes magazine. Um, you know, I find it daunting, you know, how, how to go about it. And it's, it's amazing how the market's changing now because grid connections are a gold rush now you know it's hard to get a, a grid connection for people so that can sort of create a bust in the development game and now i think there's going to be a trend for building solar farms you know i'm at the moment working on a 110 kv grid connection you know the grid connection itself might be small but it may connect a you know 90 megawatt project so, and uh, there's also an enormous space for power engineers wanting to get into the sector because you know as the feed-in tariffs are reduced and we need to have lower level of cost of electricity we need to take you know our, the, our studies about the power studies uh, from the solar cell all the way to high voltage grid if you might have for example sirens is a solar farm if your grid is only connection is only 10 megawatts with a 50 megawatt hour battery with mr michael vasek is a grid serve he could solve he connect a 20 megawatt project with a 50 megawatt hour battery you know that is real 
genius thinking in my book because some people didn't want to build a project because the grid connection is too small. And now with the dropping battery projects, we can unlock new grid capacity. We can work with different voltages. And also there is an enormous aspect that's gone missing with uh, Solar Century not building projects anymore, which is you know, working on product development, which makes the whole system work. So I'm very much excited for the next year ahead. Do you have any forward-looking statements, any forecasts for us to look forward to? Well, um, maybe we underachieved this year, reaching two gigawatts, but I think next year we, we should push for three gigawatts, maybe even four. Fantastic. And uh, the positive is the market share for JSOL is very high. So that's a testament to you, and uh, thank you for joining another episode. Thanks very much for having me, Vikram. Thanks, Matthew.